All right, let's make welcome the two funniest words in Christian comedy, Mike Warnke. They have been noticing some movement. And I would appreciate it if everyone would keep their seats until I am finished. This is especially important in regards to the bathroom. I do not do the bathroom while I am preaching because I have to go too. And there's no way for me to leave, and as long as I've got to stand up here and suffer through all of this, I don't see why you can't suffer with me, okay? We can offer it up to the Lord as some sort of sacrifice, all right? Oh, God, take this pain. I mean, you know, I mean, it's okay. The Bible says we're supposed to bear one another's burdens, you know what I mean? And don't try and walk out of here and tell me that you're going to go call your mama, because nobody walks like that to a phone, you know? I mean, even you walk out, but when you come back in all smiles, I hate that, all right now? See, I hate that. And don't want you sisters to start going potty because you guys don't go one at a time, all right? It's a, it's a herd instinct with you guys, okay? We're talking, you know. You, no, now, listen. You guys, I tell you, you guys start going to the bathroom, it's like a move of God in the body of Christ, you know? But, I, you, know, you know, I'm telling you the truth about the sisters, you know. Because, like, I'm guys are going to go and, and find a place to go pig out. See, but you won't call it pig out because Christians have their own language. We have terms to describe everything that we do so as to impress people with our spirituality by using terms that turn even our everyday activities into spiritual activities. So after the concert, nobody's going to walk up to anybody else and say, Hey, let's go pig out. <laughs> You're going to say, How about a little fellowship? <laughs> yeah, you will. And, 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 and when you're out there fellowshipping, you're going to want to really gossip. But, you know, Christians, the Christians don't gossip. They share. And, uh, and if you want to get real nasty about it, you share in love. You know, I always get worried. <laughs> I always get worried when somebody comes up to me and says, I want to tell you this in love, you know? Because I figure if the next thing somebody's going to do to me is love me, they don't have to tell me because when they do it, I'll know that they did it. And when they don't do it, I'll know that they didn't too, you know? So you ought to be out there fellowshipping and sharing maybe nine couples around a table and all of a sudden one of the sisters, she'll stand up and say, who's got to go? And they'll all, <laughs> and they'll go. They'll go. And then... And then it'll take them 45 minutes to come back. And, and one of you brothers, when they get back, one of you brothers will say, oh, what took you so long? And the sisters will say, there was a line. <laughs> of course there was a line. You took it with you. <laughs> and them sisters, you know, they all start out from the table, friends leave, but you know, as they get closer to the bathroom, they start jockeying for position, you know? It's like pole position at Daytona, you know what I mean? I mean, it's terrible, you know? And what I gotta figure out one of these days is what takes so many of you sisters in there to do. Cause it don't take that many of us brothers, I'll tell you that right now. You know what would happen to me if I stood up at the table and said, how many brothers gotta go? <laughs> huh? Anyhow. Now, there's two groups of people that are not bound by the no potty clause. The first of these groups is pregnant women. Because pregnant women are not in charge of when they go to the bathroom. Because there's somebody else in there hanging on their ribcage saying, we got to go now. <laughs> Between a pregnant woman and a bathroom, I don't care if the sister's saved, she'll hurt you in Jesus' name. You'll be saying, I'll pray for you in a minute. You know what I'm <laughs> and little bitty kids, I'm not talking about 13 year olds that are trying to find a place to smoke dope. I'm talking about little bitty kids, you know, counting as big as. 
I gotta go to the bathroom. <laughs> At that point, you got a little time. If they start pulling on any of your clothes, things will get more serious. I gotta go to the bathroom, you know? <laughs> if they start going, I gotta go to the bathroom, take them right then because you're only minutes from disaster, see? Because the next step in that parade is, I told you I had to go to the bathroom. <laughs> you know? And see, see, you'll ignore them till they make a mistake, and then when they do, you'll punish them. And you know, moms and dads punish kids different. It's like if your mama beats you, she's going to talk to you the whole time she's giving you the whipping. You know what I'm saying? She'll be saying, I thought I told you not to do that. What do you mean by disobeying me, young man? Do you understand me? Yes, ma'am. Don't you talk back to me, you know? And, and, the, whole, and the whole time, and the whole time this is going on, see, you're going, ah, ah. See, your father has a whole different approach. He comes in and he says, I'm going to kill you now. Go out and wait in the yard because I don't want to get blood on mama's floor, all right? I got, I got a bunch of kids of my own. I got six. And I got a 21-year-old daughter who is adopted. Then I got a 20-year-old daughter. Then I got a... 18-year-old daughter, then I got a 15-year-old son, I got a 13-year-old, 12-year-old, 13-year-old, she's in there somewhere. And uh, they got a 10-year-old son. And they all grew up to be, was nice because I didn't want them to grow up to be like me because I didn't want to put up with a teenager like I was, you know what I'm saying? And I figured out early what I would do was I'd just stay weird knowing that they would eventually rebel against me. <laughs> you know, and they did. And, uh, They yell at me, turn down your stereo, you know. <laughs> I'm, the only, I'm the only parent in our block that gets grounded, you know. <laughs> and the 13-year-old, I said that she grew up to be a preppy, but she really didn't. She grew up to be a valley girl. Yeah. And I don't know how that had happened exactly, but one day I was packing stuff in my bedroom, getting ready to go on a trip, and she was out in the hallway outside the bedroom door talking to a little friend of hers, telling that little friend about Jesus. And so I was listening at the door, exercising my parental prerogative and eavesdropping. And I was listening to her talk, and she says to her friend, Lake, at your house, are you guys, like, saved or what? And the little girl said, gee, I don't know, what's that mean? And Catherine said, well, Lake, have you uh, accepted Jesus as your, like, personal savior or, like, what? And the little girl said, well, gee, I don't think so. What does that mean? I don't think we've done that. And Catherine said, oh, wow, bump me out. That means you guys are going to like hell. <laughs> and the little girl said, well, gee, we don't want to do that. How do we keep from doing that? And Catherine says, well, you've got to get into the like Bible, okay, and find out what it is God wants for your life, you know. And then you get hip to that and everything like that, and you become like obedient, and then God like blesses you and everything is cool, all right? And the little girl says, yeah, sounds kind of tubular, you know. And... Uh, <laughs> She says, the only thing is, she says, I'm kind of scared of the Bible. Isn't it kind of a scary book? Catherine said, no, it's full of all kinds of really nifty stories, okay? It's like the first story, it's like this totally gnarly dude and this really tough chick living in this totally awesome garden, all right? <laughs> and they're hanging out in there, you know, and God tells them that they can scarf from like any tree in the place, all right? <laughs> Except like for this one, and if they scarf from it, it will bum him out to the max, all right? <laughs> so, everything... Everything is going cool until one day the chick is like cruising the garden, all right? And what should she see her feet but like a totally grody snake? I mean, gag me with an entire place setting, right? And the snake said, ooh, babe, have I got some fruit for you, you know? And she says, no, we can't scarf from that tree because if we do, it will really bum God out. And the snake said, no, God's just jealous because he knows if you scarf from that tree, it will make you as hip as him. Okay, she was a total disbrain, and being the disbrain that she was, she took some of this fruit back to her old man, and they both scarf from it, and now they become aware that they're like totally naked. I mean, put me on a roller coaster and watch me throw up, right? <laughs> Now they're running all over the garden trying to find some, like, designer fig leaves, you know? <laughs> and all they can find is this totally gross Kmart stuff, you know? 
And sure enough, God shows up and he is really bummed with them. And he says, ah, okay, you two are history in this place. And he kicks them right out in the street. They're walking down the road and Adam turns to Eve and says, well, you got to save yourself, chick. And she said, hey, dude, stuff happens. He said, yeah, I know, but you just ate us out of house and home, okay? kids because they've always wanted to be involved in what I was doing. I remember when I lost weight. <laughs> now, just wait a minute. I used to weigh 310 pounds, folks. I mean, you may think I got a spare tire now, but honey, it's a Honda tire now. It used to be a Michelin Radio X, all right? <laughs> and when I started losing weight, I really didn't know how to do it. So I went to my cousin, Harry, who had lost a lot of weight, and I asked him how to do it. And I said, hey, man, Harry, how'd you lose your weight? Harry said, I got this can of magic diet powder. All you have to do is take it home, put it into the blender with a few ice cubes, whip it into a frothy milk-like substance, and then you take it and sip it down, and I guarantee it will help you take arms against the sea of adipose tissue that is collected upon your personal being. <laughs> and I was thrilled, so I took a can of the magic powder, and I went home. I went into the kitchen, got the blender out, and called all the kids into the kitchen because the kids like to watch me do stuff, see? And I said, hey, guess what? I'm going to lose weight. And my 13-year-old said, like, right now? I said, no, it may take me a minute, okay? And she said, well, hey, let me go. Dog is 14 years old, right? That's 98 or something to you and me. The dog's got arthritis in all four legs, got no teeth. I mean, a dog doesn't even chase people anymore. She just sits on the front porch and says, stranger in the yard. <laughs> At least I don't know him. <laughs> yeah. And if she did bark, what would, it, I mean, how, what would it accomplish if she did bark? What would a dog with no teeth sound like when she barked? Woof. <laughs> would that scare you? Woof. You climbing in my house, you coming through the window to burglarize my possession, and you hear woof. Does that make you want to run away? No, that makes you want to go. So they got the dog in there, man, and I got my magic powder, you know, and I put it into the blender and put the ice cubes in there, turned that sucker on, <laughs> turned it right off again because I didn't put the little lid on, you know. And it shot that stuff all over the kitchen. You should have seen them ice cubes. They was like bullets in a war. And the dog, man, is up running around the table going, woof, woof. And the kids are going, get some dad, get some dad, get some dad. All except the 10-year-olds and he's saying, wait until mama sees this. So I got everything turned off, put some more diet powder in there, put some more ice cubes in there, put the lid on, and boy, when I got ready to do it the next time, man, I didn't fool around. You know, I didn't punch chop or puree or whip. I went right to liquefy, man. <laughs> We're talking heavy duty blending, because you push them other buttons and you get nee, nee, nee. You hit liquefy, you get ah! <laughs> We're talking serious blending here, all right? And I had to blend ah! Woof, 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 get some dad, get some dad. Wait until mama sees this. You know? And finally, I got it whipped up into the consistency it was supposed to be. I turned the thing off, took the lid off, the thing that puts into the blender thing, and I reached into the cupboard, got out a glass, poured some of the milkshake-like substance into the glass, put it up to my throat, and sucked the big suck, and my throat said, not in here. <laughs> <You know? laughs> It was the nastiest stuff I ever tasted in my life. My taste buds had little shovels. They were saying, get that out of here. You don't know where that's been. That tastes like what you put on plants, you know. So it didn't work, so I decided what I needed to do to lose weight was to jog. And I went out and watched everybody else jog, and they all had jogging suits. They had red jogging suits and purple jogging suits and, 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 and blue jogging suits and chartreuse jogging suits and orange jogging suits. I had to have my jogging suit made at the Tent and Awning Company, so I had a green and white striped jogging suit. You know? I looked like a watermelon with a head. <laughs> Embarrassing. 
And the first morning I went jogging with the boys, I found out I had another problem too, because all the extra 120 pounds that I had on my frame was sticking right out in front of me. And when I'd get my stride up, my belly'd start jumping up and hit me in the face. I'd be running down the street saying, jip boom jip boom jip boom I lost a lot of weight in my face. Cause my belly beat my jaws off, you know? One morning the ultimate happened. I was running down the road, jip boom jip boom jip boom then all of a sudden, my sweatshirt slipped up and my bare belly hit me right in the face. <laughs> and my navel made suction on my forehead and I nearly smothered to death before I could get that. Ah! It was terrible. And when I did pull it back down, left a big hickey right in the middle of my forehead. I looked like a bruised Hindu. I got home after the most traumatic experience of my life, walked in the door, Rose took one look at me and said, where you been? I said, I've been jogging. She said, with who, Jaws? It's, it's very interesting how people seem to get committed to the wrong things sometimes. I mean, I never really lost any weight until I became aware that I wasn't trying to lose weight to justify the system. I wasn't trying to lose weight so that everybody would really think well of me. I was losing weight because the doctor told me if I didn't lose some, I was gonna die. And so I started losing weight, but you know, the thing about it was, there in the beginning, I didn't lose keep up with all of the rules and regulations. I was so busy trying to outdo everybody else that was doing the same thing. I really never had any time to lose any weight until I sat down and realized what to do for myself. And I sat down and started to realize that it worked for me, for me. Not the players that were doing Cambridge, and not other guys that were jocking, and not the guys in Weight Watchers, but the guys, you know, they had their plan and I needed one for me. It worked for me. I don't come, I don't come in bunch acts like oranges. I'm just, good for you may not be good for me. And what may help me may not help you. But the thing that we all have to do is sit down someplace and figure out what's best for us and then do that. See? And the only reason I'm telling you this is because I think there are a lot of people that run their Christianity. They're so involved with the rules and regulations of religion. They're so busy trying to outdo the other Baptists or outdo the other Methodists or outdo the other Presbyterians or outdo the other Catholics that none of them got time to be a Christian. You know? I started gaining on my weight problem when I became aware that as an individual, I deserved an individual response to my problem. And the Bible says that each of us works out our own salvation with fear and trembling. I don't mean that we don't all have to accept Jesus, but we don't all have to belong to the second St. Luke overcoming Pentecostal Church of God in Christ with signs and fires following after we do that. Because God may not want us to belong there. He may want us to belong to somebody else. All of us don't have to do the same things. All of us don't have to believe the same things. All of us don't have to walk the same walk. All of us don't have to, to, to talk the same talk. All we've got to do is share the same Jesus. And then we're brothers and sisters in Christ. And instead... And instead of spending so much time ragging on each other because so-and-so doesn't fit in or so-and-so doesn't measure up or spending so much time running around guilty because you don't measure up and so-and-so's ragging on you. If we would all just allow each other to do as God is leading each of us to do and lend a hand when we can and receive help when we need to, then I think Christianity would be a lot more appealing thing for a whole lot of people who are trying to find Jesus in the world today. You see... I don't think that Christianity is something that you talk about. I think Christianity is something that you do. And the people out there that need to know about Jesus aren't listening to hear about him. They're looking to see him. And the only people that can show him are people that have him in their heart and start acting like him. You've got to start being committed to the concepts of Christ instead of the rules and regulations of religion if you're really going to show people Jesus. If you're going to be committed to the rules and regulations and you're going to live that, then you can show people your denomination. 
You can show them your particular slant on things. You can show them your church building, your carpet, your pews, your hymn books. But you see, none of that stuff is going to get any of those people to heaven. None of that stuff is ever going to give them the answer that they need. Because when you're looking for Jesus, there's only one thing that's satisfied, and that's Jesus. And if they're looking and they don't see him in you, then where are they going to look? 